if you're in other parts of the world other than Asia, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, welcome to this panel. Uh, Asia is a melting pot of many cultural differences and potential antipathies. Like nations elsewhere, Asian countries have reacted differently to the containment of the current pandemic. But in general, with the exception of India, Indonesia, the Philippines and Nepal, probably more successfully than elsewhere, particularly in territories like Taiwan, Vietnam, Cambodia and Thailand. Uh, I'm in Thailand and in Thailand, uh, which is where I live, in a population of around 70 million people, there have been just 60 deaths from a total of, I think, around 3,966 infections. In this instance, three factors have been obviously beneficial. The speed of official reaction to the pandemic was extraordinary. The previous experience uh, and lessons learned from having to deal with the outbreak of SARS-1 in 2002, 2004, and the generally compliant nature of Asian cultures in comparison to many other countries in the West. Diversity in Asia today arises from the influence of a global civilizational model that values diversity. Uh, individualism and to some extent a uniform approach to economic development. Like the rest of the world, Asia has been shaped for the past century by the Eurocentric worldview, the economic and military power of the US, and to pervasive neoliberal philosophy in which the main driver of progress has been reduced to a cycle of desire and consumption. As we know, this has put untold pressure on the environment and on each other. It's given rise to the need for a giant leap of consciousness in how we relate to each other uh, and to the planet on which we live. On the surface, an issue like how Asia can face, understand, acknowledge and come to terms with its inherent diversity so as to derive a better future for all are critical. But perhaps it's too easy to get carried away by the differences and ignore many factors that provide cohesion across the Asian continent. For instance, the importance of spirituality linked by moral teaching practices really like the strength of family ties as a business and support network, the use of mentorship as a way of acquiring knowledge, the fact that Asian languages have similarities in vocabulary, grammar, composition, and structure that differ sometimes significantly from Western languages, the belief in ancestor worship indicating a continuity of intergenerational modes of being, gender inequality, the huge disparities between men and women and their role in society, and the moral philosophy of discipline, austerity, and hard work in order for one to succeed. So the challenge I'd like to put to the panel today, in terms of geopolitics in a post-COVID-19 world, concerns really the balance needed in order for Asia to retain its rich and diverse multicultural makeup, thereby playing off its inherent strengths while adapting to the very different global dynamics posed by issues uh, like climate change and the growing ideological antagonism between the US and China, for example. How can we create a better future for all? And what role can business play in this that doesn't simply entrench divisions? Uh, we've got a very eminent and distinguished panel for you today, and any introductions you can read in the, the brochure attached to the uh, information about Harassis Asia meeting. So I'm not going to dwell on who we are and what positions we hold, but I'd like to start Harukata uh, with you. Harukata is a professor at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo. Professor Harukata, can we start with your thoughts, please? Okay, thank you very much, Richard. As uh, Richard has just said, uh, comparing with other regions or other continents, 
Asian countries or territories have performed better uh, in terms of uh, the best uh, in, in dealing with COVID-19. But if we look at uh, performances or within the region, within Asia, uh, comparing different countries and different territories, uh, there are variations. Um, for example, I mean, when we take the uh, numbers of deaths um, per million, um, India and Indonesia and Japan uh, record higher numbers than uh, such countries as Singapore or China. And in short, um, democratic, I mean, authoritarian, I mean, authoritarian regimes perform better than democratic regimes in the region. And the reasons why authoritarian regimes perform better is that uh, they can they can implement policies necessary to deal with COVID-19 much more forcefully, such as quarantine or tracking the record of those infected or uh, uh, forcing and testing on, on the suspected um, patients. And uh, since democratic regimes uh, respect freedom of citizens, uh, the governments have been having have have been having a hard time implementing various uh, measures to deal with uh, COVID nineteen, and this has a lot of implications uh, in geopolitics of Asia. And I would say until the beginning of twenty first century, I think democratic regimes. Um, claimed regime legitimacy, claiming that it is better uh, political regime uh, than any other uh, political regime conceivable. And that legit that claim has been supported by better performance uh, in terms of governance and economic development compared with other uh, political regimes, such as also the regimes. But uh, this legitimacy you mean, le regime legitimacy has to come with performances. And this legitimacy, I mean, has been questioned by some authoritarian leaders who claim that sometimes they can perform better in terms of economic development, and uh, like Singapore or China. And this claim has been probably strengthened by their, I mean, the better performances of such countries as China or Singapore in dealing with COVID. And this has um, probably effects on political leaders in, in the Pacific who, are, who have been wondering whether they should go democratic or whether they should go authoritarian that, uh, and uh, to to how they uh, would explain to their citizens about the choice of their political regime, and these leaders, you know, in in, uh, in leaders in so-called semi-democratic regimes, that is not democratic, but at the same time they are not totally uh, authoritarian. I mean, I would say Thailand is a is a case, and also Malaysia is such an example, and these leaders may say. Well, until now, we thought that democracy, uh, in their heart, democracy may be a better option in terms of um, respecting freedom of individuals and the citizens. But maybe, you know, authoritarian regimes may be uh, one option and they can persuade their citizens that, you know, look at how China and Singapore have been dealing with COVID. And, you know, it's people can live much safe, safe, much more safely. You know, they can go out drinking, go shopping. So I think, and now with the mess with the United States, I mean, US presidential elections, that the uh, uh, sitting president is questioning the result of um, election elections. I think the, um, quality of democracy in, in the United States is seriously questioned. So I think um, until until the big, until like around 20, 2010, the number of democratic countries have been on the rise. And now I think um, democratic uh, regimes have a hard time persuading, um, you know, other leaders in different regimes that, you know, democracy is better. That's it's an interesting point, isn't it? It doesn't seem 
at the moment that democracy is working perfectly anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter where you look. Yeah, I know. That's well, and you, yes. And, and you raise an important point. Is it, uh, in terms of authoritarian regimes, but the balance of that in terms of compliant cultures anyway, there, uh, there's a different kind of balance there. Stacy, you're... Um, you're in the US, aren't you? So you, yeah. I would love you to comment on that to start off with. Uh, well, I, I guess uh, for one, uh, one, I agree. We haven't sort of been the exemplar of a well-functioning uh, democracy lately, or at least not a one that is. Uh, um, I, I'd say it's functioning, but it, but it's not in the in the in the most exemplar manner. Uh, obviously, I think that's winding up. I think we'll find out that the institutions have held. And that as messy as it is, I mean, messiness is a common characteristic of democracies. Uh, so uh, I do have to, to say that, you know, we, you know, in, in dealing with COVID, with this pandemic, uh, the U.S. has done certainly worse than most of the advanced economies in the world. Uh, currently, if you don't know the latest statistics, but we're, we're losing about 2,000 people a day. Here in the United States, we're getting about 200,000 new uh, cases of COVID. Um, a lot of that is simply due to things that were completely avoidable that didn't happen in the Asian countries because they were more compliant. They listened to the government. They wore masks. They socially distanced. Whereas here, it was almost a point of pride among certain percentages of the population to to, to flaunt every directive from the government. Um, and we're paying the price for that. I think in retrospect, there will be a great deal of regret and that it will probably be handled differently uh, the next time. Uh, but that doesn't save the 250,000 people that have already died and probably another 100 to 150,000 people that will die before we get the, the vaccine. So um, as the, the, the representative from the United States, I'd say we haven't covered ourselves in, in glory, either as a democracy or as a response to COVID. Um, I do think uh, that, you know, we will find that, that we will pull through it. We've certainly come through through things before. The government institution will hold. We'll get past the, the vaccine. We'll come through it smarter. Uh, we'll handle it better next time. But I think this was almost a perfect storm for hitting the weak spots of, of the U.S. in terms of its government structure and its societal uh, penchant for individualism as opposed to the more Asian collectivism. So uh, that would be my comment, and I'd certainly, you know, welcome welcome the other comments from the panel. That, but Stacy, also, it doesn't seem, to, when speaking from as an outsider, it doesn't seem to have dampened the U.S. enthusiasm for innovation and entrepreneurship. In fact, if you look at billionaires, of course, they're becoming very wealthy as a result of uh, what's happening today, and. Certainly, that uh, that engine of innovation hasn't been dampened at all. No, it hasn't, and and a lot of that is we've had a great uh, fiscal response. You know, to the the I mean, there's been a big loosening of monetary policy, uh, which the U.S. had plenty of room to do because of the strength of its economy. One of the few places in the world that still has positive interest rates, so we we have a lot of capital from around the rest of the world coming into it. Uh, the U.S. is is. If anything, uh, you know, a, an engine of innovation, I think that will continue. Uh, not that innovation doesn't happen elsewhere. It's just that it's sort of a core. All this chaos uh, has the side benefit of being chaotic in a good way in terms of, of, of the, the innovations that can come out of it, as well as having the bad effects of, of you know, the uh, you know, the, you know, that we've already mentioned. So I would say you're right. It hasn't dampened the innovation, but I would also uh, put, with, say it with a, with a bit of a caveat in that, you know, while, uh, the mar the market, particularly the stock market in the United States has done very well and public, you know, in, in individual spending and in, in household income and whatnot has done very well. Uh, it's come at the price of a lot of, uh, debt being taken on by the government. Um, we don't know what the long-term impact of that will be. Uh, and the the market, and when I say the market, the stock market and the asset markets have essentially become largely decoupled from the underlying economy. Uh, the underlying economy is not as healthy as the stock market would make you think. Uh, just look at our unemployment numbers. A lot of that is COVID affected, but a lot of it is, there is other impacts as well. So I think what you'll see is these divergence of the real economy and the market starting to come back together and probably not in a good way. 
uh, over the course of the next six months or so as the as the virus as the vaccine gets rolls out and things start to 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 renormalize because right now it's really an aberrational situation all the way around. I'd like to uh, Shirley. I'd like to uh, move to you, Shirley. You is uh, unique in, uh, in this panel in that. Uh, you sit in the space between two worlds. Um, uh, you, you're in the U.S. at the moment. Your children are there, but uh, you're a Chinese citizen, and you see things from those two perspectives. So I'd love your comments on where we're at at the moment. Well, certainly at a flashpoint, isn't it? Uh, so I'd like to comment a little bit from a Chinese perspective. First of all, I'd like to talk about this uh, economic a uh, uh, pr projection that we are looking at possibly in the next uh, decade. And so um, using a Clinton word, you know, during 1992 campaign, it's the economy stupid. And I think fundamentally what underpins the global geopolitics is going to be this uh, economic rationale that underpins our global economy. And I think uh, rightly or wrongly post the COVID-19, well, at the end of 2019, China's GDP was roughly on a nominal basis at 65% of uh, that of the United States. So China was 17% of the global GDP. US was roughly about a quarter of the global GDP. And uh, post the COVID-19, China has resorted to this very massive, uh, very Keynesian style of uh, digital infrastructure expansion, circa somewhere in the uh, ballpark of $5 trillion now, all going to digital infrastructure. And we're starting to see that this infrastructure investment has really supported the Chinese economy very well. And so now we're looking at a possible world almost with 100% certainty now. At the end of this year, in 2020, China's uh, GDP on a nominal basis is going to surpass that of the entire EU, 27 economies combined. This is a real tipping point uh, in terms of understanding the global economic gravity shifting towards Asia. And now uh, there has been a lot of uh, talks, uh, particularly post the 14th five-year plan, which just concluded at the end of November. China is aiming to double its economy once again. Uh, so uh, over the next 15 years, the last time China doubled its economy in a matter of 10 years from 2010 to 2020. And so now by 2035, China is going to look at uh, a doubling of its economy again. And so what that means is very significant for the world of uh, uh, you know, the, not only the global economy, but also global geopolitics. So um, Chinese leading economists are predicting, well, now we are looking at roughly about a 4.8 to 5% growth uh, for the Chinese economy, roughly about 20, before 2035, definitely China will surpass that of the United States to become the largest economy in the world, given all current economic projections. And so that'll mean profoundly, to understand you know, not only uh, geopolitics in Asia, but also geopolitics at every corner around the world. And next, I want to zoom into Asia. Uh, coming from Asia, it's the most diverse, most pluralistic, and the most, um, I, I would say, uh, you know, a hot, I think most diverse uh, regions in the world in terms of its culture, religion, uh, ethnicity, and uh, uh, governance and the political structures. And so I don't think, uh, you, you know, when it comes to uh, understanding about so what the, the overall trend is going to be a bigger level of uh, Asian economic integration. So I think the language for Asia is not going to be a political language. It's virtually impossible to have a common political language, a common political narrative for the Asian Pacific region. It's not going to be on the basis of religion. It's going to be on the basis of commerce and trade. And we just saw the combination of the RCEP. Uh, this uh, 15 regional economies roughly represent a third, a third, and a third. So a third of the global population, a third of the global trade, and a third of the global GDP coming together. And so what's happening in China is now that as China moves to $10,000 per capita GDP, China is no longer a cheap labor country. 
a lot of the labor intensive jobs are going to continue to move into the ASEAN regions. And the ASEAN region on a per capita GDP basis today is so less than $5,000, so less than half of the labor cost of China. And now uh, huge demographics, a lot of young labor force in a way, that is something that China no longer has either because China is aging very, very rapidly. And so with that complementarity, China inevitably will start to move a lot of the labor intensive industries into the ASEAN region. It's just inevitable. And so this year, post the COVID-19, we saw that uh, uh, ASEAN has already overtaken the EU to become China's largest trading partner. And I think this trading relationship is just going to continue to intensify. And so the Asian integration on the language of money, wealth, uh, commerce and trade, all these practical uh, realms of discussions. And I think that is a, a unifier that's going to unify the region closer together. The other thing that I noticed very strongly with the Asian integration, it's actually China's fintech expansion. So just uh, this year in particular, we saw TikTok was banned in the United States uh, uh, with the executive order, WeChat was banned, but at the same time, what we are seeing is all three companies from ByteDance to Alibaba to Tencent, uh, they have all moved their Asian headquarters to Singapore, and they are all hiring hundreds and hundreds of uh, fintech tech uh, 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 talents in Singapore. And so they are radiating all throughout the entire ASEAN region. And I think uh, once uh, in the, the, the regional economy would know that uh, Alibaba has uh, recently put its uh, hands on, put its hands on Grab. Um, and uh, Lazada, so that's the uh, Asian uh, version of uh, e-commerce platforms. And so a lot of uh, these uh, fintech integrations are going to continue to happen. And I think what's really, really exciting is China's uh, imminent launch of the sovereign digital currency and China's fintech platforms, particularly Alipay and WeChat Pay. These are, uh, these are the fintech uh, infrastructure that ASEAN regions really, really need. They are in a way very, in a very similar situation to where China was 10 years ago in the sense that uh, people don't really have credit cards. There is no very sophisticated mercantilist banking system within these countries. And the fintech platform is just going to come in and bypass that whole 20th century uh, banking generation. And so I think all, a lot of these things are going to be extremely exciting. So not only in the, uh, uh, physical trade of goods, but also in trade of services within the Asia Pacific region. And I think the other thing is geopolitics, which is the topic today. Um, it's a, it's a reality. Geopolitics is just going. To, Asia Pacific will continue to be the flashpoint, and particularly when you have indigenous rights in power with a uh, preponderance uh, global power. Uh, that exerts its uh, military and uh, uh, strategic influence in the region. And I think as both powers uh, seek more space, uh, the uh, the tension is just inevitable. But I think that the bigger question is how do we avoid a uh, uh, situation where it, the tension gets out of control? And, and I think that's really, I think I sh that should be the focal point of the discussion in the geopolitical realm in the coming decade. Thank you. Uh, uh, Tochi, can we uh, move to you for your comments on, on everything so far? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seems like please. a very difficult task for me. Um, comment from a country which is not growing like China or the US, unfortunately. Um, I mostly agree with the uh, first comment of, you know, Takenaka-san, uh, which is uh, between uh, democracy, democracy and authoritarian. But at the same time, I'm thinking that the real problem lies in uh, the situation that that dichotomy, uh, uh, democracy versus uh, authoritarian, is becoming uh, ambiguous and not clear anymore. That's the uh, you know, biggest uh, problem, uh, especially in Asia, because um, probably Japan is one of the most uh, stabilized country after World War II in terms of, you know, uh, political, you know, system, et cetera, et cetera. But even in Japan, after uh, having this, you know, COVID uh, pandemic and after losing our, you know, confidence in economy, um, you know, some people are more enticed to have more controlled economy or, 
more restriction on individual rights or those things. So imagine other part of the world, I, I mean, other part of the Asian countries. Most Asian countries have less stabilized system, uh, less stabilized political and, and economic system, which can be easily enticed to the, you know, new management of a kind of a combination of information technology and a restriction on individual rights. And, you know, man, if, you know, you can, uh, successfully show, like in COVID pandemic, that you can manage your country well with a coup or with a demo, uh, demonstration or with a, you know, any, you know, uh, anti-government movement, then why don't you, you know, follow us? You know, if, you know, country which has been successfully managing, uh, COVID situation, then they can have such kind of persuasive power. That's a real challenge for Asian countries, I think. So it's not, you know, clear dichotomy. You know, as you know, Shirley said, you know, China is having great success in economy. You know, no, nobody can argue that. But at the same time, you know, old democratic country is thinking, you know, there may be something wrong. But we cannot say that wrong because we don't know the best recipe for less stabilized countries in Asia, how to manage their country. So this is our challenge, not only for us, not only for the U.S., not only for the China, but as a people uh, living in you know, Asia on, on this globe, you know, how to deal with uh, individual right or freedom and you know government control uh yeah. is becoming some very important issue and yeah. it had been going on even before a covid pandemic yes. uh, you know in the business world uh you know data economy uh, was utilized uh not only for the expansion of economy but at the same time for controlling people but you know nobody has landed in the you know correct answer for how to deal with it so that kind of, you know, very big issue uh, uh, for people in this globe uh, is now uh, being highlighted in yes. this region as well. That, that's my thought. I, I think that's a very good point. Harukata, you were nodding furiously uh, during that. Did you want to add something? Um, uh, well, I think it's I think it's still dichotomy. It's very clear. I mean, like the, the 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 difference between democracy and authoritarianism is very clear. You know, whether you have a free and fair election, so that's the criteria. Uh, you yeah. Just, yeah, but sorry, sorry. as you yeah. said, yeah. as a system of governance, uh, if we look at only in Asia, because if we include authoritarian regimes in other parts of the world, it does not necessarily mean they perform better in terms of economic development, nor in terms of dealing with COVID. But for some reason, I mean, that's the subject of further research, like Singapore, China, Vietnam, Thailand. All of these countries can, cannot be classified as democratic, but in terms of having free and fair elections. But... Um, they they do very well in containing uh, COVID as well as um, promoting economic performance. So regime legitimacy has to come with performance. And so as 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 uh, Tochimoto san says, you know the dichotomy is not so clear uh, in, in especially in East Asia mm. uh, in terms of choice for political leaders and citizens. Uh, whether you should opt for, you know, democracy or authoritarianism and to pursue um, better economy, better economic and social well-being, uh, you know, authoritarian regime may be an option uh, for them. So that's that's um, that's a serious situation uh, for me because I, I be, I'm a believer in democracy. So um, yeah. I'd, I'd like to take the panel and welcome uh, Samrendra, who's just joined us. Uh, I'd, I know you were struggling to get in, so uh, well done with persisting. Um, there are two things that bother me in terms of the conversation at the moment, mm -hmm. and, and I'd like us to address those. The first is this notion of 
unrestrained economic growth everywhere mm -hmm. in, in terms of even the most developed nations that probably don't need it. Uh, and the direct link of growth to the damage we're doing to the environment. Uh, mm -hmm. So the question there is, can that endure in the situation where we're living on a, in a finite, uh, a, a world of finite resources? Uh, but the second question is more geopolitical in in the current stance between the the state in the U.S., which has declared quite openly on a number of different occasions that it simply will not allow any other state to assume the kind of global hegemony that it has enjoyed in the part in the 20th century, uh, and that. Uh, relative to Shirley's last comment is, I find alarming because of the current tensions, uh, ostensibly with trade, but actually they go far deeper than that. It's about the hegemonic power um, and the balance of that. Uh, can we deal with those two issues? Stacy, let me come, sorry, Sam Randra, just, just let me come to you uh, second and Stacy first because uh, the US is, um... Sure. So, I mean, I think the uh, I, I think you phrased it. You framed the question pretty well. I mean, in the end, the, the hegemonic power ultimately de derived from the economic power, and the yes. current system, of course, goes back to Bretton Woods, which was set up after World War II, where the US essentially had the world's one undamaged economy with, that could generate a great deal of demand. And then in Bretton Woods, they set up an economic situation where we could use that demand and help set up the rest of the, the world, if you will, along the guidelines that we sort of set. Uh, and everyone sort of, you know, you could pick, you could be on the side of the Soviet Union or you could pick on the side of us. And we would take care of free trade. And, and you know, that worked out pretty well for everybody, especially the U.S., um, and that from that, that from that economic power, we derive the military power and, and a lot of other things that exist today. Now, that's not I mean, I think what you what you comment is, is um, and I, what I, part, the part I agree with is that's not going to persist into the future in terms of the U.S. simply dictating what happens in the rest of the world. The rest of the world is getting a lot bigger. Um, and uh, as a percentage of the global economy, the U.S. is still the biggest, but is not nearly as big as it used to be. It's not nearly as dominant a force. Obviously, the EU of the trade block is now huge. China and Asia is huge. Uh, the U.S. doesn't get to dictate anymore. And to be honest, you know what I think you hear the U.S. saying is they don't want to dictate mm. anymore. I think you see the U.S. essentially pulling back both uh, to a large degree economically because the U.S. economy actually isn't as well integrated into the rest of the world. If you look at 80 percent of U.S. trade actually happens between North and South America. Um, you know, we're, we're independent in terms of food. We're independent in terms of energy. We don't have to trade with the rest of the world for a lot of things. So, you know, you know, we're the, con the economy can be fairly insulated. And I think you're, what you're going to see is the U.S. essentially turning inward and pulling back from engagements particularly in things since we don't need oil anymore, like from the Middle East, which I think mm -hmm. is a destabilization in that region. Mm -hmm. um, you see us pulling back from, from, uh, from NATO to some degree, uh, I think. And I think you see us pulling back, to, you know, although the, the pivot to Asia, I think you'll see a lot of the Asian, the historical Asian alliances taking more of a front and center role, uh, particularly Japan. Uh, which is which has really come a long way and, and, and is very influential. I think it's one of the great underrated forces, not just economically, because everyone knows that, that Japan is a great economic power, but just in terms of the geopolitical power, uh, they're very understated, but are a force to be reckoned with. Uh, South Korea, and I think you'll see a lot more uh, dispersion of influence in Asia, which I think is the focus with the U.S. playing a strong role, but also seeking, to play, particularly under the new administration, uh, a more supportive role in more of a uh, working with its allies as opposed to simply dictating as it has essentially in the past. Sam, let's bring you in here. I know you're itching to say something. <laughs> yeah. so, so let me, I want to kind of get more on the geopolitical side. And then yeah. I will take the autopsy. 
autocracy versus democracy debate i will also throw in my hat in the ring okay so let me just take you back to history from 3500 bc to 1700 ad for over 5000 years asia was the preeminent global power so 2 300 years is a very small time in the history of the world uh, and asia and in asia china and india were almost a quarter each of global gdp then so uh, so the asia's rise which again began with japan post war economic miracle in china as you leadership at the turn of the century so that is likely to kind of it just represents a return to historical norm so it's not a extraordinary historical event and the shift of global center of gravity to asia is likely to get further accelerated uh, due to pandemic because the H west is ruled by covid and asian economies have had given a very robust response so pandemic may actually be the point when asian century actually began so let me just also quote some statistics asia is about 60% of global population uh, young population 43% of global uh, you know fortune global companies by revenue the largest ones are headquartered in asia the reasons conglomerates and companies have pivoted quickly and kind of uh, gained in value and valuations and as per mckinsey asia is likely to be about 52% of global gdp by 2040 so many many asian countries are also digitizing very rapidly and two of the world's fastest digitizing economies are india and asia uh, are sorry india and indonesia so however there are a lot of risks uh, as we move from a us centric unipolarity to a uh, china centric bipolarity in asia the transition may be dramatic because there we see the tensions in south china sea uh, india china india pakistan even as uae bahrain and sudan improve relations with israel i think there are a lot of fault lines in the middle east and the caucasus uh, china's ambitious dra projects are also running into some rough weather uh, internet is becoming splinter net you know the trade and technology is becoming confrontational and just about this democracy versus autocracy i think uh, democracies have been criticized for being popular and autocracies for being heavy handed my take is very simple poor leadership leads to bad outcomes irrespective of whether you are autocracy or democracy so i'll leave it at that i'll not get political uh, 2019 was a year of protest protests are making a comeback uh, covid has also reignited the debates about resiliency of global supply chain and reducing dependence on china so this uh, debate of resiliency versus efficiency will keep go on pendulum will swing towards resiliency in times of crisis and it will swing towards efficiency in in times of uh, you know when times are good so coming days will be interesting full of opportunities and risks uh, among the nations and companies there will be winners and losers so asia's rise is inevitable and irreversible and the pandemic has only hastened it the task for asian leaders is simple three things fight the common enemy virus improve politics move from jingoistic nationalism to uh, more of cooperation and fix the economy so that is it thank you back to you richard Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, I want to be mad, Shirley. Yes, I would go, go, go past to you. <laughs> I just want to uh, respond to Stacy for a couple of points about the United States. I think the first one is uh, in, in, since March when uh, the U.S. closed the, the border. Uh, Apple, Google, they have both come out and said that they were going to do this contact tracing app. U.S. politicians, politicians, the strategic thinkers are saying, "Well, it is effective uh, to do contact tracing." Well, this is eight months down the road, and we still don't have a contact tracing app in the United States. The Silicon Valley arguably have the best technological know-how in the world. Why did this take so long? When it took only two weeks for China counterparts. to develop a contact tracing app and that is now you know that's been proven to be so effective i'm talking about i don't fully agree on this uh, you know a uh, uh, political dichotomy between democracy and autocracy it's about effectiveness of governance you know we have still a valley who have the best technological expertise in the world who are not working on this sort of thing and when you hear about the us presidential election now you're talking about machines that have back doors that can be uh, maneuvered Where is Silicon Valley? I mean, with all the best technologies, and so uh, there is a lot of things that we need to think about. I think, you know, it's not just about the political governance. It's about you know you, you, the best um, talents and the best companies within this country. They got to work hard, and they got to you know they have this drive to move forward. And now this year, we're starting to hear that the uh, TikTok is going to be sold in the U.S. 
simply Facebook just does not have the similar model that uh, TikTok uses or ByteDance uses as an ecosystem. There is simply just not an equal counterpart for, uh, you know, WeChat, you know, this whole Chinese uh, digital economy and its ecosystems uh, that China is building. And so now, um, U.S. got is uh, my my thinking is that the U.S. has got to try harder, and also the digital infrastructure. I keep getting here. This is in the middle of my Manhattan. I keep getting here. Signal uh, unstable, weak Wi-Fi. I mean, come on. <laughs> we, uh, don't we deserve better digital infrastructure here? I mean, post the COVID nineteen, the U.S. Fed has pumped enough dollars this year that is equivalent to the entire one year GDP of the European Union. We have printed that much money. We should put it into infrastructure. We give it to individual citizens at twelve hundred dollars a pop. Great, you know, good for the citizens. But invest the sum into the future, and I think that's the best sort of investment. We are not using it in the right place. I'm, I'm going to just leap in before Stacey to say, first of all, I think Silicon Valley actually has moved to Tel Aviv. I think the innovation coming out of Israel now is quite extraordinary in comparison. But the other point that, in terms of Legitimization, which、uh, we were talking about previously, is very interesting because、uh, the more, if you observe、uh, around the world, the more a government becomes more authoritarian,、mm -hmm. the more of the budget it has to spend on legitimization. That either means、uh, tax cuts for the wealthy, for example, because that's where their base is, as we've seen with Trump. Or, or it means more spending on the military and policing, or incarceration of citizens. So,、uh, you know, I, I find that very, very interesting. That even in a so-called democracy, the more authoritarian the regime becomes, the、mm. more money has to be spent on legitimization of various kinds. Stacy. Well, I mean, now we're in my my, my sweet spot because I'm a technologist in 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 run、yeah. companies. So、uh, when we're talking about tech in Silicon Valley, I mean, the U.S.、Uh, you know, and I and I and I and there's not not to take anything away from Israel because as for their size, they they certainly punch well above their weight in technology.、Uh, but the U.S. Is, is, in in Silicon Valley does very well. There's a big difference between. I'm using you by saying that you know that. Oh yeah. Oh, no, I'm sure. But there's a big difference between developing technology and getting people to use it. Yeah. If I could develop a,、uh, a a contact tracing app tomorrow, and half the U.S. would say we're not going to we're not going to do it just because we don't want to. Just like half of us will probably not take a vaccine even if it's available. So、right. you know, it, it's a messy messy situation. But from that again, from that chaos、uh, comes a lot of the innovation. And I think the U.S. is going to maintain the leadership in innovation. There, there's there's certain fundamental technologies such as semiconductors and other things that the U.S.、Uh, is in the lead in, as well as I mean, not in Asia. I mean, if you look at South Korea and you look at Japan in, in semiconductors and other things that are, are in great positions, that you know, frankly, the rest of Asia is playing catch up. So、um, I think that it's going to be interesting. I think that, that the development of Asia in China, in particular, as a market, is is very impressive.、Um, But I, I think the U.S. is going to continue to maintain its leadership in, in some very fundamental technologies into the future, and it's going to be interesting to see how that dynamic plays out. I think one of Shirley's palm,、uh, points was though the speed at which things can happen, not just in China but in Asia generally. The speed is, I've noticed, is quite extraordinary when people want something to happen. It can happen much faster than in, in the U.K. or Australia, or Canada, wherever. Um, and remember, I think we, we have COVID right now, which is sort of to, you know blotted out the rest of, of of what we're thinking about. But we won't always be in a pandemic situation, and the the situation where we look a little the government system of democracy, which hasn't you know really done as well as the more authoritarian regimes so far in dealing with this, the COVID will not be around, and we'll be back to all the other aspects of life. And I think that's where the the democratic system will really shine again. No, well, I think. I think we really have to think how democracy, democratic regimes,、uh, ad adapt. I mean, the, what kind adapt what kind of governance in in the state of emergency? We we have not experienced this kind of emergency. So、uh, Harapata, I'm going to have to stop you. In、yeah. terms of that, I think、uh, there the will be future pandemics, and they'll probably be worse than we've got at the moment, which is、mm -hmm. another issue. I would like to thank everybody on the panel. We've run out of time. It's such. 
uh, uh, I'm so sad that we've run out of time because we were just <laughs> beginning to get started. But I'd like to thank all of you very much. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, everyone. Thank you. I now, thank I now you. keep in touch. I now have to take us all off air. All right. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.